uh, meats and vegetables, mainly charcuterie. Uh, charcuterie has been around for a long time. It's basically the low man in the totem pole in the kitchen uh, taking all the scraps and making something of them that they can sell, which really goes well with what you are trying to do today. Um, in my kitchen, anything that is left over, if there's onions, things like that, that are going a little south, or you know, they're just not something you want to put in a salad, we'll go ahead and pickle them and usually use them in a charcuterie item. Um, what I try to teach my employees, and I guess you all try to teach your students, is the potential for uh, your growth in yourself and your knowledge in your uh, products, the potential for you know, raising the price on your products. Um, basically, as a chef, I look for, when I'm looking at items, for things that you know are going to cost more, it's going to be local. Right now, you know, if you're getting heirloom tomatoes, things like that, you're going to pay more for them for, uh, than you would from U.S. Foods or Cisco and things like that. Obviously, the quality is a lot better. So, realizing and talking to the farmers about the potential of their products, what they can do with them, mainly how they can uh, prolong their life on, on the shelf, because organic items are so. You know they're so fickle. The the greens they, they will quickly, they die quickly. Everything it, the tomatoes they rot quicker because they're not grown in the same way. Um, and really naturally they have more microorganisms in them, which cause them to break down quicker rather than what Cisco or something like that has in a uh, mass production. So basically, what I try to get the farmers to do is market their products on the reputation of someone in the community that, as far as restaurants go, like chefs, that have a good name, for them to get their, that chef to you know, talk about their products when they're out in the restaurant so that they end up at the farmer's market and buying their products. Um, it just helps out as a whole if you have a representative that really knows, out, knows how to go out and push your products. Um, also, in, as in a restaurant sense, uh, we like to have a lot of these mason jars that are brought in like this. I don't know if you've ever been to a restaurant where they actually have all their canned goods out in the restaurant. Have you all been to a restaurant where they have the, the pickled items and things like that? Okay, well that's a great selling point. I worked at a place down in Charleston, South Carolina called the Wild Olive. And they put all their pickled items and cured meats and things out on the walls, out in the dining room, and they sold a lot of it that way. So. That's to say that your farmers, you know, even Anthony Plot Veno, for you all who know him, even at the end of the season, he's throwing away product, throwing away fennel, throwing away tomatoes, throwing away greens that he just couldn't sell at the markets. And then I took a bunch of his fennel one time, pickled it, and it gave him a great idea to start pickling it at the end of the season and being able to sell it at the farmer's market. So, you know, with the mindset of a chef, you're always trying to, and as a line cook or anything, you're always trying to save your product, but when you're throwing product in the trash, it's just money down the drain. So trying to learn how to preserve that uh, in a legal standpoint too, because uh, you can't just can you know, some onions and then go sell them at the farmer's market. So you have to make sure you know where your facilities are that do such things. Do you all have canning facilities here in West Virginia? Um, we have a, we have, uh, plants. We have paint plant. You have one? Do we have any? I think we have anything other than Gourmet oh, Central. Um, so I know of. There are several in Pennsylvania. Okay. What about the blue smoke? Didn't, smoke? didn't, didn't she get that registered to blue smoke salsa? The salsa? I think she should have it. Okay. Well, the thing is, you have to have a certified kitchen to do that. We have like three of these canning facilities just in Southwest Virginia, within about a 50 mile radius of each other, which is really good. And all you have to do is, they'll do them in number 10 cans or they'll do them in these mason jars like this. But you take your product up there and your solution uh, recipe and they will do it for you. And it's that's the way it's legal. You can sell it as a retail item. Um, but the more of that product that you can get into cans at the end of the season or out of your restaurant, you know, that's just money sitting on the shelf, you know, that you're going to be able to sell them down the road instead of throwing it into the trash can. Um, we'll 
start off kind of with pickling since I've been talking about it. You got your basic pickling is obviously just in a brine. Your fresh pickling, which a lot of people don't do anymore, is just adding water and salt. That's it. And what's really cool about this is I never really knew this until I studied up on it here recently. Is fresh pickling it um it creates a good environment for microorganisms that's good for your digestive system, which allows your body to digest foods properly, get the nutrients out of them better. Um, I don't know if you ever noticed a lot of old timers, they'll eat um, a lot of pickles or pickled items with their meals. And I don't know if they learned that when they were kids, you know, through generations, but you know, that's really good to eat some kind of acidity with your, your main meals to help digest meats and other vegetables and things like that. But fresh pickling is the only type of pickling that will allow those microorganisms to live and actually be helpful to your, your stomach and be in the same type of bacteria that you have in your stomach and keep that replenished properly. Nate, when you, you talk about fresh pickling, so that, that's sauerkraut, right? Or is it? Pretty much. Pretty much. Sauerkraut, uh, kimchi, those yeah. types of things. They, uh, fresh pickling is like a quick like within four days you can eat those pickled items and they're ready to go and they're good for your uh, your stomach bacterial uh, equilibrium basically. When you get into sauerkraut and kimchi, that's a fermentation pickling, that's a different type. That's where alcohol is developed uh, and then once the alcohol dissipates from eating all the sugars, then you have that nice sour, just rotten tasting kimchi or sauerkraut which I love. Um, kimchi is not really um, in the taste of most of us. Have, how many people here have even had kimchi? You've had, okay, so a few. Okay, well it's basically just a spicy sauerkraut. Um, I do kimchi with the Napa cabbage and basically just mix it up with local peppers or sriracha, which gives it a little more of an Asian flavor. So it's more conducive to Asian dishes because, you know, when you're using certain types of uh, kimchi, you want to use them with other Asian flavors. So, just to help out as far as that goes. Um, kimchi takes a long time though. I mean, it can take months to even years if you want to. So that's another great thing about, you know, this type of year, or this time of year right now, we've got all these beautiful greens floating around, but a lot of them are gonna go to waste. A lot of them are gonna be thrown away. I know a guy down in Asheville at the uh, market he does collard green kimchi and pickled collard greens and things like that. You want a hearty, hearty green like collard greens or a napa cabbage. Or, um, and you can even make kimchi out of regular white cabbage like you would uh, sauerkraut. The only difference with it is you would add hot peppers, maybe some onions, like some fish sauce. Uh, they even put oils in their kimchi. The Eastern, or, uh, Eastern philosophy is that that's what they'll do, they'll add sesame oils, any edible oil, stuff like that. So you can really play with it. The thing is, is what you want to do, especially you all teachers, the ag teachers and uh, ProSART, is give the students this knowledge of not looking at uh, an ingredient as like, oh, well, I can only make sauerkraut out of that. Or, I mean, you can pickle it a hundred different ways. You can market it a hundred different ways. It's finding the potential in, you know, this fennel. Pickled fennel is amazing. I don't know if you've ever had pickled fennel, but it is absolutely amazing. And then also you can sell these fennel fronds. I used to buy these just from the market. This stuff right here is just, it tastes so good. It's like almost like a really light licorice, you know. And they're great garnishing as far as like a chef's standpoint, garnishing in the kitchen. You know, recently we go through all the stuff that nobody wants. You know, we want the, the fronds, we want the seeds, like just the seeds off of a uh, cilantro plant, they're amazing, they pop in your mouth, you know, chefs will buy that stuff, the flowers of plants, you know, that's a very small window when these things are fresh, but as far as like the school, you know, you guys, I don't know if you work with farmer's markets, um, do you all work straight with farmer's markets at times, like where you take the produce that you grow on school grounds and go to the farmer's market and sell it, have you done that yet? Anybody? No? Well, maybe you should take Why not? <laughs> I mean, that's selling is the main point of making more money on your product, learning how to do it. Because if you got, you know, if I'm at the market and I'm selling this pork and I'm back here and I'm all shy and I don't know how to sell it, 
you're probably not going to make any more money on it. Sure. So teaching that to your kids, how to sell it, how to be um, uh, personable with people, you know, that's really important in being able to get these products out there. Uh, teaching, it's really all about the, all the kids, all the students, you know, making sure they understand the potential of themselves, uh, the potential of their products, and, you know, thinking outside the box. You know? And a lot of the stuff that I'm show, I'll show you today has been done for thousands of years. It's nothing new. It's just we've kind of forgotten it. We've kind of lost it as a culture, you know. But a lot of your all's parents and grandparents, they've been doing this stuff for years. And the biggest thing, like in Abingdon, we've got one of the most beautiful uh, farmers markets and rich in different types of foods. I mean, it's amazing. I came from Charleston, South Carolina, which is a huge restaurant. Foodies. I mean, people just love weird, crazy food. But their products are nothing compared to what you all have up here in Appalachians. They just don't have it. Uh, it's just too hot down there. We've got great humidity up here in Appalachian Mountains to do these prosciuttos and grow wonderful vegetables. Our greens are sweeter because of the cool, crisp air, you know, in the, in the springtime. Um, they just don't have that down south. But the people here are so used to eating this stuff, they have no interest in it. Does that make sense? You understand that? Like, you've grown up with heirloom tomatoes all your life. You really don't, that's heirloom tomatoes. You don't really care about it. But now you take that to the city, and they'll pay like 15 bucks a pound for heirloom tomatoes. I know in Avenue Farmer's Market, they sell some of these uh, heirloom vegetables and chicken and beef and things like that for, I mean, up chicken itself, I've seen eight to ten dollars a pound. I mean, that's crazy. I wouldn't pay that myself. <laughs> People buy it. They love it, you know, because they don't want to eat the crap that you get in, you know, Kroger's or wherever, you know, that's mass produce and full of hormones and all that stuff. Um, but it's really the only change, and what you all are doing is amazing. You're like way ahead of us in Southwest Virginia. You really are. Everybody's got a bad uh, rap on West Virginia about being backwards, but as far as what you're doing right here is, and working with Dell and Alan, you're way ahead of a lot of places up there and a lot of people that I've talked to as far as our school programs and things like that. So, yeah, just keep that keep that going. And I, I hope to learn a lot more from you all and take this back to Southwest Virginia. But I think the, the point I'm getting at is the youth is what's important because their palates are what's going to take them to the next level when they get older. And what you're feeding them in the school today is what they're going to want to eat later in life. Um, you feed them crap now, they're going to want to eat crap later. And, you know, it is. I mean, that's true. Right. Um, I've talked to like 60 lunch, I had a meeting with like 60 lunch ladies. <laughs> Some of them angry, you know, just mad at the world because they've been in the kitchen for so long. But trying to talk to them about how to get fresh, right? Yeah. <laughs> fresh produce in, you know, in the, in the cafeteria. And it's so hard because of government contracts and price and logistics and just trying to get the food from the farmers to and consistency there's always a big problem with consistency as far as the product size and, you know and when the farmers are closing up shop for the winter that's when school goes in you know so that's another problem um, but they were you know they wanted to do it but they've been doing something for so long that they can't it's hard for them to change direction you know? So you guys are doing really good. On, you're starting somewhere and you're pushing it. So keep that up. I'll get back to what I'm supposed to be doing here. Uh, so we got through pickles. When you're, this is mainly pickle everything. Teach your kids to pickle. If you can in school and find a way to sell it, do that. You're going to have to have a certified kitchen. If you pickle it fresh, from what I've done, you can sell it. If you pickle it, a cold pickle, where I say you don't can it. Because if you can something, you have to have it in a certified kitchen. So you can take it to a cannery and do a hot pickle, or a hot pressure pickle, or you can do a fresh pickle. And I, I've sold it that way in Virginia. I don't know if you can do that here or not. But it will preserve, um, and it will bring you guys uh, added value to your product, and also another uh, you know, revenue stream. Uh, also, one of the biggest things, and you know, you, 
eat with your eyes, so your different types of vinegars, your sweet vinegars like a sherry or a balsamic, you know, you can pickle fruits. I pickle a lot of blueberries, things like that. You want to pickle uh, fruits when they're not as ripe, when they're nice and firm. You want something hearty. Apples. Um, you can pickle oranges and things like that if you want, but you want to use them quickly because they will break down quickly with the acidic atmosphere that they're living in. So certain things are a little more sh uh, shelf stable. Uh, hard root vegetables, those will last forever as you know. Carrots and, you know, uh, beets and things like that. Well, let's, <clears throat> let's take a, a minute and kind of spin that out. So suppose you did a, a, uh, a carrot and you did a, a fresh, so what would, what would you, you do in terms of size or something like that? What, um, well, as far as size, it depends on how long you want it to sit on your shelf. You always want bite size as far as pickles, a serving portion such as, you know, with a sandwich, um, things like that. So you obviously you wouldn't pickle a whole carrot. You know, you want to clean that up, cut it down. Uh, one of the, the most receptive pickle uh, fruits that I ever did was blueberries. People love pickled blueberries. And like a sherry vinegar and a sweet brine. Don't, I mean, uh, and you can even take, uh, yeah, no salt whatsoever, you know, just sugar and your vinegar, and then let them set on the shelf. And, and, or in the, uh, I usually do like a cold room, like downstairs in the basement, something like that. So, basically just, what I do in charcuterie and garmage is just preserve everything. I mean, everything. And if you don't use it, as far as in the kitchen, at least you maybe sold a little bit of it, made a little bit of profit off of something, earlier you would have thrown it away. Now that's from a kitchen standpoint. I don't know how you all can apply that into a school. Um, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to in the school cafeteria. Uh, but that's that's a lot of the different walls and hurdles you have to figure out through what you are trying to do. Uh, when you're pickling, one of the main things is just be sterile. Clean up your vegetables, especially if you're doing fresh vegetables, uh, like fresh pickling. Make sure everything's just cleaned up, uh, sterile environment. A lot of times if I do fresh pickling, I'll take the uh, mason jars and dip them down in uh, boiling hot water, much like your grandmother did and stuff like that, you know, when she was making tomatoes and stuff like that. Helps out a lot. Uh, again, on a business standpoint, to make sure you're creating a new revenue stream and, you know, making your product last longer and making it worth more uh, you're going to get a new market share with it you know if you're producing just produce at the farmers market and then all of a sudden people know that you're pickling that same produce you know you're going to have a new market stream or market share come in people are wanting your pickled items um, also a good selling point with all this it helps when you're in a market where you're getting people from outside your area especially in cities and things like that, in restaurants, is selling the point of your heritage and your traditions from the pickling, like your family has been doing this for so long. Uh, maybe some recipes that your grandmother or grandfather passed down. You know, chefs, they eat that stuff up. That's something they can sell their dishes with. You know, people right now are really head over heels for local ingredients, um, you know, old traditions. You know, they just love that stuff. Things that people don't know a lot about anymore. I know a chef down in Charleston, he brought back a lot of the old, like, 1920s uh, drinks, like bar drinks, you know. Like the old, old, just recipes that nobody drinks anymore. And it was a big hit. So, bringing back the past, stuff that has been lost in this um, corporate world that we live in. That's everything's just, you know, marketed in a way that ruins the actual product and the heritage of where, where it all came from. Is an early shucking corn will get an extra buck for pickling something. It's also, from a restaurant perspective, when we were at Stonewall Resort, we had a, a, a menu item um, called, I don't even remember what it was called, but it was basically the bow tie pasta and shiitake mushrooms. It was a vegetarian dish. So when we were going through and reworking our menu, we renamed the dish uh, Boxies and Butterflies. 
And basically it's from poly pasta, which is bow tie pasta, and morel mushrooms. We put a story to it. Uh, we renamed it. We added, changed a few ingredients, and we raised the price by seven bucks. <coughs> That's value added. Put the story with it, changing a few ingredients, putting a little indigenous ingredient into it, and getting a little extra cash out of it. It's it's what it's what Dave was saying a minute ago about about having a story, and I think one of the things that, that he said was tremendously important is any time you can get, if you're a farmer, you can get a chef or someone else to essentially be your spokesperson or your advocate, that's an important piece. That I happen to remember that when I was on the menu, Dale said, I was thinking of you while I was out, um, what's the, what do you do for mushrooms? Just foraging, foraging for, for mushrooms and thought this would be a really great dish and so I'm in this spring and thought I thought I'd bring it back to you. So everybody thought that he had done this just for them. And then so it was, you know, just like you did that yeah. just for us. Yeah. <laughs> so but it, but it made a tremendous difference. A uh, you know a twelve dollar item goes to eighteen dollars and uh, it's essentially uh, the story that uh, that makes it. It does help. It does That's help. the truth. Uh, jumping into uh, cured meats to kind of reiterate on talking about where the product's coming from, getting it represented. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with Alan Benton from Tennessee. He was a school um, counselor. And I guess he cured meats on the side, just made bacon. But he got tired of working for the school system and decided he just wanted to, you know, make bacon and cure pork. And he smokes his pork for like three days, hickory smokes, and cures it. It's a really smoky, really solid. It's amazing bacon. It really is. Alan Benton's bacon. Smoked Mountain Hams. But he had a couple chefs from New York and a couple from South Carolina start using his product. And the next thing you know, he is the biggest bacon producer on the East Coast, yeah, I mean, amazing amount of growth within just a few years because he had some big name chefs that fed food to extremely rich metropolitan men and women in the inner cities of New York and, you know, and they started just going wild over this stuff. And he has been the uh, head cure at Black is it Blackbird? What is it? Down Blackberry. At? Blackberry Farm. That's right. Blackberry Farm down in Tennessee. So I mean, he's blown up. He's just a, you can call up, call uh, Smoky Mountain Hams right now, and most likely he'll answer. And he's just an old country boy that makes bacon. But he's blown up because he got the right people uh, promoting his product, mainly, and that's it. I mean, I know amazing farmers down in Abingdon that. I mean, some of their products and the stuff that they do, I would put up against anything in the world. But they don't choose to really push it out to these big city chefs. And they just enjoy, you know, living the farm life down in Southwest Virginia. So it does make such a difference if you're trying to sell your products to a restaurant to throw in that heritage and that culture. And I guess you could make something up too if you have to, if you really need to sell it. I mean, elaborate. You don't have to lie about your teeth. But I mean, you can elaborate a little bit on how old your grandmother was when she did that or something. Who knows? <laughs> Do whatever you want on that, but that's up to you. Um, as far as curing meats, you can make a lot of money off cured meats. When you take this, this hog right here, her name was Charlene, <laughs> and I used uh, wow. I used half of it at the cook-off, the flush was missing some part of the leg. But I cured this a year ago, oh, a year and a half actually, about a year and a half ago. If I can get in here, I'm going to show you all if I can get in. I've got well, a bone. That, that was hanging when we were down to the, uh, yeah. when we were down in uh, the yeah. first week of May. So Shannon, you were there? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is that the same hog leg? Same hog leg. Okay. Yeah. 
What's that? He said you guys must have got No, we did. <laughs> I'm trying to get in here to show you all the thing is the sun is special, right? Yeah, that smells good. Um, but she was an Osawal hog, which is a heritage hog. It's kind of like up there with Berkshire, but it's a lot fattier. Like, a lot of fat. Say it again, please. Osawal. Osawal, heritage Osamal. hog. From Laughing Water Farms, Marie Antoinette. But this is a year old, or a year, it'll be a year and six months. And I paid four fifty a pound for this. That's awesome. And I mean that's just that's just what they're gonna go for. Now if you got a Yorkshire, which is your normal pink hog with a little curly tail, they're like a dollar fifty a pound, something like that. Now the initial investment is obviously waiting for a year for this thing to, you know, mature. But I don't know if you've ever had like uh, Iberico hams and things like that from Spain. You know, they go up to eighty dollars a pound. So if you can invest, you know, your hog production, say just two of the hams, or all the hams out of the hogs that you kill, produce the rest of the meat, sell it however you want, fresh, and then just take those hams over a year and uh, cure them, you can take a dollar fifty a pound hog and turn it in to probably around here forty five to fifty dollars a pound to a restaurant. Now that that's an amazing amount of upsell. That's real value, right? That's Isaac, a Isaac, what would you what do you sell up? Ham, your ham, not not the ham. What would you sell up? A fresh ham for? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. We don't necessarily sell fresh ham, but the Greenbrier pays five seventy five a pound. Really? For a hundred seventy five pound carcass. Wow. Eleven hundred dollars. That's quite good. That but and that's not unusual because there are other there are other restaurants who would be willing to pay more than that. I mean, are, the vault restaurant would pay fifteen seventy five a pound for first tender. So you sell it a pound? Yeah, that's crazy. And they process it themselves. Nate, you want to make a talk about? I'm not sure how how many of you in here are familiar with cured hams. These are the type of hams that Europeans are accustomed to, like a serrano ham or a prosciutto de Um and when you go to the restaurants in Europe, they you, the halls are lined with legs and haunches of pork that are cured. Yeah, what's really cool about this is like, we, we all have country ham. We have country ham here in Alaska. And the only difference between the country ham and a prosciutto that's worth $80 a pound is that they age it. A country ham is just not aged. They just, you know, you, they salt it. And then once it's, once it's cured, they start eating. They stop the aging process by either freezing it or, you know, wrapping it up, and then, you know, that's it. That's in this country ham, and it's, they don't get the age. If it would have taken the time to hang it, which you can, we've got a great atmosphere here for it. We've got great weather for it. Uh, Abington, all the way up in the Appalachian Mountains, we've got good humidity change. Uh, it's a great environment to age hams. Now technically, you're not supposed to age them in a traditional way here in America where you hang them up in your barn or in your basement. You're supposed to be in a, uh, in a controlled environment, you know, below 40 degrees. But you can't do that and have a really good ham. It just won't work. You have to have the fermentation and the aging process or the sweat. So getting around that, I don't know how you do it. I, I just do it. When I was in the restaurant, I did it. I'd put it in my wine room, I let, I let them hang. And I would have the heck come through, but they didn't ever look in the wine room, so it was good. Do you think the shoes are like personal? Like, do you think that the shoes are the idea that you could do it or anything? Oh yeah, we have wonderful weather for it. You basically, the process of a prosciutto is you kill the hog just like we always do here in the Appalachian uh, in the in the fall. Kill them in the fall. You cure during the winter because of the, the cold weather. You know you won't have any uh, any spoilage. After the cold weather comes in and the spring is about, so you let them cure for you know a day and a half per pound usually with the salt, and then they let it just hang right like in a cold cellar. Well, the first four months it hangs in a 
cold cellar like the winter. The second four months you'll hang in the spring, which is a little bit warmer. And then the third four months is what they call the summer sweat. That's when it reaches the internal temperature of the ham reaches above like 70 to 80 degrees. It starts sweating. It starts creating alcohol inside, fermentation. The salt begins to come out. And then that's when the flavors really uh, change. That's when the flavor of a prosciutto starts to happen rather than it tasting just like country ham. Okay? Um, that's when you come into play with these nitrates and nitrite salts. Those are very important. You have to use those when curing or you'll, you'll just end up killing somebody with some foodborne illness. Um, What's really cool about these salts is like, we've been curing meat for, you know, before Christ, like 2200 BC or something is when they first documented uh, the curing of meat. But people were dying left and right because uh, just food spoilage, you know, that was a big thing back then was this foodborne illness. But they noticed like with some salts, like the meat started getting this red color, this red hue. Because, I mean, this is a year and a half old, it's got like a nice red hue. Those are the nitrites and nitrates working. Um, nitrite is like fast acting. It's a chemical that reacts to the meat that helps uh, stop any type of foodborne illnesses, things like that. And then nitrate is like baby nitrite. It's like eggs. It's a slow release. So for cure number two, which is this one, you use for a lot like long dry aged meats that are going to ferment that you're not going to cook. And then for cure number one, I'm guessing your dad uses a lot of this for his fresh sausages. That's okay. That's for like fresh sausages, things that you're going to cook. Um, they stopped using cure number two back in the mid '90s because they found out like when you actually heat it up and cook it uh, with a product that is carcinogenic, so it can cause cancer. So at any point, if you all ever do cure, or if you you know establish this in, into school systems where you're teaching this kind of, this kind of uh, technique, you never want to cook with cure number two because it's very carcinogenic. Like it used to be in bacon in the mid 90s, and it is not now. Um, but with prosciuttos and bacon, the amount of money that you can make on curing it and preserving it is just tenfold anything else. From I mean, pickling is something that you can just sell, make a little extra cash on something you're going to throw away. But compared to selling a ham, you know, at a dollar fifty a pound, to selling it at forty or fifty dollars a pound, I mean, that's awesome. That's crazy. You know, that's something that you can really make some good money on. Um, this obviously a year and a half. Uh, this is one that's about a month, and I'll open it up for you and show you the difference. This one has been all over the East Coast, that's why it looks a little rough. Because I use this in a lot of like presentations and showing people on how, how it looks. But now at the cast iron cook-off, it, it, it was amazing. I mean, it was at its peak, and it was really, really good. Maybe after you get that opened up, maybe people want to come up to the table and, and look at it. Yeah, you're more welcome to come up yeah. and check it out. See, uh, you were talking about the color and everything on the, on the other. The color and the smells. Yeah. I don't know how you would uh, introduce curing and the production of curing and um, preserving meats in schools. Do any of y'all do that at all at schools yet? You do? That's awesome. What kind? What kind of meats are you doing? Uh, we main bacon program. So bacon? Yeah. Okay, so bacon. Bacon. A lot of our schools have meat cutting facilities because of that. Okay. That program. You, are you doing any age, dry fermented or anything yet? Okay. That's a little more advanced techniques. So, I mean, but to introduce that would be amazing because it's uh, it's, it's biology, microbiology. It's all microbiology. And understanding microbiology will help the students understand how the meat is breaking down, how it's preserving itself. Um, so you tie all that together.
Now this, this is young, right? This is a month. She's a little morbid. But this is cured with garlic and black pepper. Easy. And how many pounds? Uh, what was it, 10 pounds? Nine pounds at the end of it. And that's a deal. That's a deal. Yeah, that's, a deal. That's, that's a real deal. That's just me. I'm just saying. Yeah. Like, um, for I've seen people pay four or five hundred dollars for oh, that, not people but chefs. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, when I worked down in Kiowa, we would pay. What was it? It was three twenty-five for one from Spain. That was the same for Yeah, it was crazy. Um, but I say, you know, you start off with something like this. I've never, as far as myself, like down in Avenue, I don't ever charge it for the market to, because I'm carrying 10 right now for a private farmer just to see, we're trying to test the market. If we can sell more for she does. Um, I think we will be able to. You just got to find the people that care about an aged hand. It's mostly going to be chefs. It's going to be people like at the Green Rock, you know, things like that. Um, it's not going to be at the grocery store, most likely. You're not going to be able to sell it at the grocery store. Uh, I was telling this gentleman over here, or where you went, oh, right here. I would not sell Ossobal really to most people just because of the fat cap as far as a consumer. Because the judges at the cast iron cook off uh, took points away from me because I gave too much fat. I love the fat on this thing. I mean, it's amazing. I almost like the fat better than I do the, the meat part of it, the protein. Um, but as far as the consumer, they're going to want lean, pink pork, you know, like they see on TV. So as far as, like, if you were thinking about doing this out of school, I would just buy cheap Yorkshire porks, take all the hams off, um, throw them in your cooler, and let them age. And that way, and you could even take the bone out. I was telling him also, I don't usually leave the bone in. We, we do that for just aesthetic value. Um, Debone them, couture them back up, and that way when they go to actually cut them, it's much easier. You're going to get more yield, everything. So. Nate, you just said something very, very important, I think, and that is um, you ain't the customer. That is, your taste is not necessarily mm -hmm. the customer's taste, and, and um, that that is correct. That um, that despite the fact that you would think that, I mean, you would think clearly the judges for the interstate competition at the Green Bar, you're talking about the executive chef of the Duquesne Club in Pittsburgh. I mean, this is really uptown. Yeah. 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 But they did have that. They did say that, mm -hmm. you know, so, and, and the reason I'm bringing it up is you really do, we had the situation, Dale and I had the situation within the past week where um, we're talking to the sporting club, again, you're talking about people who have two three quarter of a million dollar homes. I mean, they have two homes each for three quarters or a million and a half or whatever. So this is hard, hard money. And they were talking about beef being overhung. That is, you know, really expensive beef is, is dry age, maybe 21 days, like that, right? Yeah. And, and <coughs> you were saying, again, in the same way that the judges are, have sophisticated tastes and yet not, didn't like the, that much fat, here are people with all of this money who have very sophisticated tastes who think that if it's aged too long, or that it tastes gamey. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true with grass fed. You know, there are, so you really need, the point that I'm trying to make, the only point is you really need to continue to survey what, who it is you can sell to, what they want, and just, and you make the customer, despite the fact that you would like it this way, they may want it a different mm -hmm. way. All goes back to, if you're gonna make money, you gotta be, it's like market research. Market research? Yes, yeah, due diligence. That's like the most important thing in business is due diligence. And that just means instead of just taking a product and throwing it out into a market and saying, oh, we're just going to test it out. 
I mean, how, is it, how much does it cost you to throw out, you know, your product into the market? Say you put five grand into a, a market and you're just testing out a product. You know, before that even happens, you should go out and survey, you know, as much as that market as you can. What do they want out of a certain type of product? What are the characteristics of the product that they like? Moisture, uh, sweetness, like you're talking about your mouths, um, things like that, you know, get the kids to do surveys. and. Um, what do they like about the products that they're eating now? And how can you emulate the products or the characteristics that they like in the products in the school, but then use your local ingredients and things like that? And do that before you put your product out there so it will save you that much money. Um, and the other thing with it, absolutely everything you're saying, the other thing is you also want to try to grow them. So it's a case of maybe um, begin with something that's a little sweeter or something mm -hmm. and ratchet it back so that you're you know, that, that you're actually changing their taste over, over yep. time. Yeah, that's uh, especially in the school systems, I mean that's where you're gonna have to where you're gonna see the change is gonna be slow at first, introducing these products. But then after you've taken over the market, which you will eventually hopefully with you know local ingredients and products, after a generation has went through a couple generations that went through, they're going to grow up in a, in a place where these products are every day, just like the, the mediocre products that they're eating now. And you won't have to educate them and change their mind. They'll already want those products. They already want good ingredients and you know local ingredients. That's the that's the battle you're fighting right now is years and years of of fast food and people that were greedy and figuring out that they could add this pink slime into this beef or add, you know, however much water solution into beef and sell it to the kids and they'll eat it because they're on government contracts and they have to buy it. You know, things like that. You look at Cisco, I mean, this is amazing. They say they add 2% uh, water solution in their beef per pound, right? And just say it's a dollar a pound, so it's two cents on the dollar. Now they're selling how many millions of pounds of beef a year? All right, now add all those two cents up, and they're just add all they're doing is adding water solution and salt solution. So that's where they're making their money. And the pink slime, things like that. And pink slime is not the only thing that they put in food. There's a ton of those fillers out there. For some reason, pink slime just got the it got the headline. But there's a ton of that stuff out there that they throw in the food just to pack it in there, and it's just empty calories. It's not good for you. It's poisoning most of it. You know, it's just most of it is poison. But as far as back to the business part is, it is due diligence. You know, you find out your market. We're talking about curing all these hams and hanging them up here. You know, you got to find out before you even hang them up how you're going to sell them. Make sure you're able to sell them to the school systems or to local chefs. You know, however you want to do that. You just want to make sure you know where you're putting the product. Same way with the pickled items. You know, find out who, who's going to buy that stuff. You know, pickled items, the first thing I would do with pickled items is sell it to your local pubs and bars where those old men sit around and smoke cigars and eat raunchy, you know, bar food. And maybe they want some pickled eggs and some pickled <laughs> onions or whatever. You know, that stuff is great with beer. Not when you're kidding. <laughs> you know. Nate, I, I do want to go back to one other thing. Absolutely. As in almost everything in life, both ends of the spectrum are true. Your point about doing research is what I was talking about, find out how they want it. The other thing that's true is that you can actually, I think if you have a property, you can actually grow your clientele. I think one of Dale and my favorite stories is one that Tim Urbanic had had this to me. Hey! It is that Dale Urbanic at Cafe Semino Hotel. His, his business is now 12, 13 years old. And when he started in the first restaurant, he would put out a, uh, a little um, plate with a piece of celery, a carrot, and a couple of cured olives. Not olives, not olives from a can, but ones that he cured. He takes olives and he, he, uh, I don't know, he soaks them in olive oil for you know, a month or two and they become, you know, this really neat thing. Well, his wife Melody would say to him when the olives would come back, look at the money we're throwing away. 
And he says, yes, but I'm growing my customers. He now sells plates of olives for $9 because he taught people how to have more sophisticated tastes. So it's a matter of everything in life is knowing where they are and then seeing if you can grow them. Dale and tell them a story. Tell them it's your grandmother's on. I mean, I don't know, but I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting piece. That's hard to do. I mean, to, especially in a market. I don't know what your old market here is in yeah. Western Virginia or in this area, or for that matter, Bridgeport. Um, but in Abington, it's a wonderful, beautiful town, wonderful agriculture. Uh, you know, good population. You know, median salary of about forty-five thousand a year. I think it's the median. Um, but as far as the pallets, they eat crap all the time, and that's what they want. They, it's not about the food, and that's one of the biggest struggles for me and some of the other chefs in town. I've had two top chefs uh, leave the Tri Cities area just because they were tired of dealing with the market. No one wanted to uh, open up their pallet, or they were never taught to try new things. You know, they wanted to eat potatoes all the time. And, um, I don't know if you ever heard of John Shields. He was a townhouse in Chilhowie, Virginia, which is like, you know, it's a McDonald's and a gas station, and then it was a five-star, five-time restaurant. I don't know how he got there. It was on a, he came out of uh, Chicago, and he took the job and had recognition all up down the East Coast, you know, from, you know, all types of different uh, prestigious uh, James Beard to Bon Appetit to Food and Wine, all that stuff. I mean, he was a great, still is a great chef, but he left because he was doing two plates a night. You know? It was $125 a plate, but I mean, that probably had a lot to do with the economy and things like that, but the majority of these people just didn't want to eat that type of food. They didn't want to open up to it. So finding your market or what people want and then trying to figure out how to grow the market like Alan's talking about, that's a that's a battle that you're going to have to do on your own and figure out where you, how far you can go without spending too much money and losing your business and still making money from the people that are, do want to eat there and just have normal taste. So it's, it's hard. you really got to know your market. You've got to know how many people are going to come and eat meat potatoes and then how many people a week can I get to eat something different or how many can I get to come back and eat something or want something different? We have a very small group of foodies, but it's not enough to sustain a restaurant. So if you guys are, depending on the ones that are interested in running a restaurant or just for a school that atmosphere, if you're trying to sell, you know, you've got to know how long is it going to take to educate people? Or, you know, how many people right now do you have in this area that's going to want cured hands from the high school? I guarantee this, the hands, if you do them properly up here, will be amazing. I mean, they'll be, you can sell them just like you could an Iberico ham from Spain, but you got to make sure you got the market set up to it. I don't see why you couldn't sell it to the Greenbrier or some of the other huge restaurants or hotels in the West Virginia State. So, you know, that's, that's up to you all. You got to figure out how to get it out there. And that's what I've been battling it out in Abingdon is, We've got the people that go to the market and buy all these wonderful vegetables and meats for high prices, but you don't see them out in the restaurants because they, the most of the restaurants now are served to the major market, which is meat and potatoes. So it's it's been an uphill battle for me down there, and I'm sure a lot of you fight that here with the school systems. You mainly fight what the the government as far as the regulations. That's the biggest thing that holds you all back. And just do it to students who want to eat Yeah, and that's it. They don't know anything else that we don't want to eat. And something else, I mean, I've thought about, I've worked with schools here and there, but, you know, I mean, they're going to eat what you've got out there, right? I mean, if they're hungry, so you can show, you know, good food out there, seasonally food, and they're going to eat it, because, I mean, a lot of students, I mean, that's the only meal they have, right? I mean, not all, not all of them, but I mean, a portion. So, I mean, if they slowly over the years that they're in school eat a changing seasonal menu, then their palate will change 
automatically. You know, I mean, it's not that them choosing the good, it's that they're going to be forced to create a new palette, a better palette. You know? So that's something to think about, is just get it in there. Uh, I think that's one of the opportunities that we have, and I hope that's part of what we're, you know, we're working towards is to change the palette, to introduce new things, uh, to use local in schools and more of that. And and it's going to be a slow process, but we've got to start in there, and we've got to start doing it. Yeah, that's the thing. You've got to start doing it. Right. I thought about it a lot, and the only. Uh, probably repeating myself a little bit here, but that's just the only way that I can see it happening is what you all are trying to do and what we're all trying to do and what we're doing here today is trying to obviously make more money with the products, local products, keep our economy strong locally, um, have ourselves and our children and our children's children and our young adults eating better, uh, healthier lifestyles. But the only way it's going to happen is if we, you know, forget about the old adults that are you know, they're already stuck in their ways. Not you all, but <laughs> the ones that are stuck in their ways and they don't care about this and they still eat, you know, bad diets and things like that. It's you gotta go ahead and cut this to the young kids in, in preschool and in kindergarten and uh, grade school and get them eating good in school and having the teachers be the parents because most of the parents aren't being parents anymore and not teaching them properly that way. Um, you're not going to see it, like she's talking about, you're not going to see it right now. You probably won't see it for a generation. But when the kids that go through a whole 12 grades and they have went through a system, such as maybe this system will be in a couple years, that they've been eating good and been taught about good food and seasonal food, not only by teachers and postdoc, but actually in the cafeteria, what they're eating. And they start noticing, and it's getting etched in their head that they're eating butternut squash in the winter, and they're eating fresh peas in the spring, and they're eating heirloom tomatoes in the, in the um, summer, and corn. And, and then over 12 years, they notice the seasonality of what they're eating. That will be ingrained in their head. It will be ingrained in their tongues, which is most important. Because when you eat crap food for years, and then you eat like a real tomato, it tastes bad because you don't know what that tasted. You don't know that supposed to, tomato is supposed to taste like that. So you've got to have a palate to accept those natural flavors, and then when they eat fast food, they'll recognize that that fattiness and that nastiness, and they won't want it. They won't want to eat it, and they'll naturally eat better. And then when that generation that finally goes through these 12 grades of a good school system with a proper uh, nutritional plan, their kids will be taught by the parents, finally, again, how to eat properly and how to live properly as far as the diet goes. Because the parents now have been going through the system that we have now, and they're not able to teach their kids, not because they're stupid or they don't care, so they're ignorant, because they've been taught that way for so long because our school systems, our cafeterias were taken over by, you know, government sustained contracts and things like that to make it cheaper and more profitable and things like that. So I think that's the main thing you want to focus on is keep doing what you're doing, but I mean, it's, you're going to notice it in the generations that come. It's going to take probably many years before you see it, but it's you all now setting the foundation and putting those ideas into the young minds um, that's going to make the difference 10 years from now. And you'll probably get frustrated like me. I've been frustrated like crazy down the avenue trying to get people to change their minds. Um, and I've been there three years in July. But now that I look back at it, there has been a good amount of change. But it has been changed a little bit, you know. But that's what you're going to see. You're going to be frustrated for many years probably. And then 10 years from now, you're going to have some good kids eating properly, and then they're going to be, they'll turn into good mothers and fathers teaching their kids how to eat properly. As long as you can get the school systems to stay on the same track. It's hard though to serve fresh food consistently, cost effectively. It's extremely hard. Even in, even in a restaurant with trained kids out of culinary school or trained chefs, it's still extremely hard. So to have your cafeteria ladies work like that and understand and be educated to 
do that kind of food, it's going to be, it's a task. It's going to be hard. So, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hard. When you were talking about fresh, um, fresh brine, fresh, what was the fresh pickle? Fresh pickle, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you can show that, can't you? Oh, yeah. I'm going to do a kimchi for you. I'll do just like a really simple kimchi. Um, but I, wanted, I do want to get right on prosciutto just one more time with you all and talk to you about um, the microbiology of it. What's really cool is the reason all these different hams are so good is a lot to do with the atmosphere. Like I said, we have a good atmosphere where you all here in West Virginia and down in South West Virginia. Um, but it's all about the, uh, the microbes that are in the air and like a, some of the best hams come from where they slaughter the pigs actually right next to the rooms where they hang them and cure them because of the bacteria that gets into the, the walls and things. So actually, and this is totally against defect regulations and health code and all that stuff. You can't do this, but when you have, to get really good sausages and really good hands aged, you have to have kind of a dirty atmosphere. You do, and you clean these hands. I clean these hands like once a week with a vinegar and salt solution because of the microbes that help break down the ham, um, they start to kind of grow and bad ones do produce. And you'll get the white mold you've seen on a lot of the hams hanging in the shops and stuff. That's good, that's good mold, I mean, that's good for you. It's not gonna hurt you. But um, as that grows, it can change into different molds that are bad for you. And you have to wash them, you have to really take care of them. But honestly, any books you read, um, this is one of my favorites right here. Uh, the art of fermented sausages. This gets into the science, uh, pH balances, uh, humidities, everything that you need to know to stay in the legal realm. If you guys decide to do this up here, you need something like this. I just want to say thanks. You just verified everything I've told you for the last six months that white mold is in mold. Yes, well, a lot of molds are good for you. A lot of the stuff that's in your stomach, the bacteria, uh, microorganisms, it, you know, people are way too clean these days, honestly. Um, you need to have that stuff in your stomach. It helps you digest food. It helps your uh, digestive tract, everything. Um, you've got to have them. Um, that's why if you buy, the gentleman was talking about the prosciuttos that you make, they make in like a day. It's like a week, I think, process where they just inject the brine in it. It's, it's terrible. But a lot of people think that's prosciutto, and it's just a crappy hand. Beef. <laughs> <laughs> you, taste, you taste that ham, which I buy this ham at, at the restaurant I work with just for lunch meat. You know, it's just salty, it's got a decent flavor, and it's cheaper, so it makes my sandwiches make money. And that's the thing, that's what you're always battling. Um, but now you try this ham in a year, and you'll know the difference. It's like an heirloom tomato compared to a cardboard tomato from Cisco. You know the difference. And that's why you can charge more. But the labor, the amount of care and love that goes into this ham over a year, is, it's not as cost effective as brining a ham you know, in a day. So that's, that's going to be your battle all the time. Uh, money and then quality of product. You will always battle that. But the more you localize it, it will help. You know, like you're talking about bringing in making the muffins you know, right down the street. It will help with that a lot. Um, yeah, but I thought that's really interesting. I mean, it, the the environment that your ham ages in is what it's going to taste like. This ham was aged in a musty basement, and it had that flavor. It was aged with wine, you know, in a wine room, and uh, in a beer cooler. Musty is a good word. Musty is very good. Musty is really good. This one will be aged in a walk-in cooler and in a very warm beer uh, beer room, so I'm interested to see what it's going to But see, I can't sell this. I won't ever be able to sell it. Not legally. So I've got 10, I've got 10 hams that I'm going to produce in a traditional fashion, but I can't sell them. So, you know, you all will have to. Huh? You're just not certified. It's not certified. It's weird the way the laws are. It's like, I can't sell these in the restaurant, but if Say I'm in Virginia, this is really weird. I can sell, if I'm a hog producer, I can take my hog, get it uh, processed, and sell it 
before it leaves the building to sell it to, say, a restaurant owner. It's already sold. It's done. Now, I can do whatever I want to that pig. I can cure it, and I can hang it, and do whatever. And then I can give it to the restaurant owner, and it's legal. But that restaurant, I can't actually take that leg and cure it in my restaurant in a traditional fashion and, and sell it. It's very odd. I don't know why it's like that, but it's just a loophole, I guess. And you do it as a favor to the restaurant. Huh? You do it as a favor to right? Yes. You can it's process. Weird. It's a weird mm -hmm. You can sell it to the restaurant raw and keep it over here, not in the restaurant. Do whatever you want to it, and then give it to the restaurant, and they're able to sell it. It's very weird. <laughs> Is that the same here in West Virginia? I don't know. That's just the laws here, or I'm in South West Virginia. So. West Virginia, I think it has to be a lot. Uh, you have to sell the whole rest of the line. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, there's just, the laws are different everywhere. There are loopholes. That's what they're for. Use them, find them. The government does. You can do it too. There's another one you want to be aware of in West Virginia in terms of West Virginia inspected plant. If it's not USDA, you can sell to a hotel, but you are limited to sell to a restaurant. That, and that's how we're able to sell to the resort. For a West Virginia inspected plant. Because it's a hotel. But they can sell it through their restaurant. But they can sell it through their restaurant. But I'm limited in travel in terms of working with a restaurant. That's like and, and that's important because there's only so many kill plants in the state that small bottles. So yeah, not that you have to have that skin. So and it's USDA certified plant. The one that does our scalding is West Virginia plant. West Virginia plant. The one that's USDA is a skin plant. But it's really good. Uh, you can use every bit of the pig, which is amazing. That's another thing, you know, you can buy a whole pig up at the school, you know, you can run it through every bit of it to do something. Okay. Um, to have them killed and, and split when they come back, uh, the kids do all, we do all the fabrication, we cut everything apart. So you teach them primal cuts? And the yeah, we, we go over cuts. Um, they decide on their own animals what they're going to do with everything. From their, you know, we pull their hams and their bacon's off. They decide what they're doing with their loin and the front shoulder. Yeah. A lot of them are going into uh, chops and sausage. Um, some of them will do some front shoulder roasts. Um, they take that product with them. Some of them sell it. A lot of them enjoy it way too much to sell, and they leave it at home. And, uh, or that's the exchange. You know, the parents say, "You can do what you want with your hams and your bacon's, but we're going to eat the rest of it." So. And we put their, their hands into cure. We actually freeze bacon it's just because it doesn't take as long. So we freeze their bacons for a little while and then bring them out and cure. But uh, as far as what I've talked to you about today with pickling and the curing of meats, there's nothing but money to be made on that. There really, I mean, everything that's left over, you can sell it. You just got to find the people that want it. You got to market properly. And you got to sell it. No, yourself. So, I brought some tasso ham up here. I don't. Does anyone know what tasso ham is? Have you all heard of it? It's like the best. Ever. It's um a big southern thing. It's like one of the main staples of shrimp and grits down in the south, in the low country. That's what I use in my shrimp and grits. But this is just basically a Boston butt, which is the shoulder of a hog. Well, if it's so good, you're going to let us try it? Yeah, we're all going to eat all you want to. It's very spicy, so we can get some water. Let's get some grits together. Yeah, I'll cut some up for you. But this is a really easy ham to make. I mean, it's a, it's an aged ham that it's just a lot of cayenne and cumin and coriander and garlic. And uh, they just set it, set it back in the fridge for a very long time. How long? Uh, it depends on it depends on the size of the, the hand. Like these are small pieces that have been cut up from here. So, the pro start students are the ones that cook for the students in the cafeteria, and then the uh, cafeteria staff monitor and you know enforce the rules and regulations as far as the heck things like that in that kitchen, so that they get real real life experience. And you can take that meat and take it straight to the kitchen, you know, and have that, that little circle of life right there. And that's what we did in culinary school. And there's no reason we couldn't do that in schools. And so, but there's no reason that we couldn't take a basic culinary school format of seasonal change and um, 
cuisine change and apply it to a cafeteria in a school to where he's talking about the students only know bacon and pork chop and then you know you start off with American cuisine that would be bacon and pork chop to January in the first three months or whatever and then you know second uh, part of school go into international cuisine where you're doing Italian maybe some French you know small you know but just enough to let them understand you know basic terminology things like that so by the time they either are through the class or through their you know high school years they've got a general knowledge of business of different types of food different ways to apply uh, one cut of meat you know rather than just being a pork chop you know things like that to where it, it not only opens or educates them on food and beverage but it opens their mind up to look at other things in life because not everybody's going to be uh, in food and beverage. I hope not. You guys don't want to do that. <laughs> not everybody. But when you go into like real life situations, instead of just looking at something as, you know, a car or a, a painting or whatever that you're trying to sell, you look at it with an open mind and saying, what else can I do with that? How else can I apply that product in a different way and sell it for more or sell it in for something else, you know, for a different purpose. How can I turn, you know, that mirror into a table rather than just looking at it as a mirror? You know, that's what we're talking about with food. That's what he's talking about with a porchetta. He looks at a porchetta and all you know of it is being a porchetta. You don't look at it also being, could be bacon, it could be pancetta, it could be, you know, that opens your mind up to look at things differently and not just so boxed in as seeing one type of product for one use. You know, that's the whole thing. And if you can get, that's what the beauty is about food and beverage is that it, it makes your mind creative. It makes you have to open up like garbage, man, big time. What we're talking about today is finding ways to use all this scrap that normally you would throw away. You know? And that applies to so much more than just in the kitchen than just in life in general. Of how the things around your house are to save money or to reuse things. You know, that's something that you, that's important to have period, as an adult, a young adult, as a child, whatever. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be a good thing, maybe, to look into talking to some culinary schools, Asheville, Johnson Wells, CIA, and see if they could help you put together a program to start out of this base foundation and working that into your cafeteria and school system. All I'm going to do is a simple, simple process, and I'm just going to cut these vegetables up. Uh, toss them up with salt, a little bit of uh, sriracha, get that going. I'm going to stuff them all down here and then I'm going to top them off with uh, some vinegar. Uh, not not all the way, but I'm just going to do about halfway and let it do its kimchi thing. It's going to break down itself over a few days and, you know, in a few months you'll have some nice sauce of kimchi.
right, we're doing the uh, Napa cabbage and fennel kimchi. We've chopped that up pretty fine as far as the fennel. The cabbage is a rough chop. Uh, we're going to do a quick pickled kimchi. We're not doing the traditional fermented because I don't, these are mason jars. These will seal, and with the fermentation, you'll get the gas build up. You might blow up in your house at some point. Whoever takes it all. So we'll do a quick uh, pickle. That way you can eat them fresh in a few days. We won't have the fermentation on. But uh, I'm just talking to this gentleman here about the crops that you can buy, kind of like the uh, sauerkraut crops. You can do this at home, get your uh, kimchi crop, uh, put it into your ingredients, and just let it sit down in the basement for a while to ferment. The gas will escape uh, in a safe manner, and you'll have nice kimchi in a few months. Yeah. And this is it's very variable. You can go for a long period of time, or you can go a short period of time, depending on what your flavors are. If you want them real stinky, nasty, very flavorful. In, in the crops, like you don't want to do that in the jar. No, you don't want to seal them up because it's a permanent yeah. one. You know, just like making beer or something, you've got to have something that's going to release that gas. So, or 